Good morning, HASP. Thank you all for being here this great November day. Well, November is traditionally the month that we look to for giving thanks. Family and friends gather, and we celebrate and give thanks for our many blessings, large or small. And I say, God bless America, and blessings to HASP for what it represents. Uh, particularly this November, we are, as you all know, I can't skip this without saying something about what's coming up next week, but I'm neutral. We'll be giving thanks for our privilege to vote for a new commander in chief. Now, some of our residents in Holland, they have already have their signs out, their signage displaying who their feelings are for. Uh, my brother-in-law recently vi uh, visited from New Hampshire, and uh, he said he only has one sign out on his lawn, and that says simply, vote. And so, there is one other voting opinion. I was going through my clip art um, last week doing a presentation for a class, and there's another sign I came upon, and this person or this object only have one thought in mind, but we all have our own opinions. Here we go. Turkey. <laughs> I just, I don't know, it made me laugh, you know, we all need to have a laugh, it's fun, you know, it's, it's part of being healthy, so it just amused me for some reason, I decided to make a sign, so, what? So, HAS News, our organization is buzzing, we have a lot of good classes going on, the curriculum committee is already hard at work planning for our winter, spring curriculum, and thanks to our membership for a lot of their good ideas. We cannot do this without you. It isn't just the curriculum committee, but it's all of us coming together to do a really good job um, for HASP. Um, I, so I want to thank them for their guidance. Dr. Ryden gave a nice talk from Hope on the political scene. I think I came out a little bit better. I don't know, I was a little muffled, but um, I, I got the picture. Um, Amy and I had a nice opportunity to go to the scholarship luncheon that, has, uh, that Hope had to celebrate the people who contributed to the scholarships. And we had the privilege of sitting with uh, Spencer Wesley. You know, he is one of our scholarship recipients, and he is also uh, was our intern this summer, and Spencer is also the president of his class. And so he represented the scholarship students with a nice introduction and prayer before the luncheon. And he thanked HASP for our support, which is really nice. And Dr. Knapp also acknowledged that, too. And uh, I think he gave a little credit to Amy um, for his education. He said he learned how to address a business envelope. So Amy, wherever you are, you're, you're part of his life. He's a business major, but he really appreciated her expertise. So Chelsea was a rather student, but she wasn't able to be there. And I also saw a lot of HASP families there who have been contributing individually to the scholarship for many years. So that, that was just really great, and I thank you for that. I want to make one more uh, acknowledgement, and that's to thank the late Winnie Hollenbach for designating HASP as a gift option from the contributions given in her memory. So thank you, Winnie. One more congratulations, and I don't know if you noticed uh, in the newspaper, the 2016 Encore Lakeshore Award, uh, three of the seven recipients were HASP members. So congratulations to Jane Armstrong, Dr. George Zudema, and Reverend Mike Van Dornick. Thank you so much for contributing to Holland, and it was great to see your name in the paper. Um, today, our program is on the Midwest Regional Airport. And I was thinking back on my air travel experiences as I read the monthly bulletin. And I do appreciate the importance of the regional airport to Holland. Nonetheless, I have to confess, uh, I'm not very fond of airports. And that's because they have airplanes. And I do have to confess that I, I'm very terrified of flying, even though I've probably flown 40, 50 times. It's still terrifying. Maybe it's a control issue. Maybe I don't like my feet leaving the ground, and I just feel uncomfortable. But um, it's somehow or other, you know, I just get really upset. And I was kind of reminded when I worked at Loyola, uh, we had the experience of going down to Hill Rom in Batesville. That's the place that makes beds. And they also make caskets, too. But they make <laughs> so. Uh, 
so I really didn't want to fly. They had seven corporate jets, Lear jets, and so uh, they were going to send one to the airport in Chicago to pick us up. I begged my husband for weeks if he would drive me down there, but he said, absolutely not. You're going to fly with your colleagues, so I didn't have much of a choice. We taxied, just to make a long story short, we taxied in the runway, and the Lear jets stopped. There were seven of us on the plane. The sales guy was great. We had the donuts, the coffee, and the whole thing. It, the plane stopped, and I thought, what's happening now? It turned around and came back to the terminal, and they said, one of the engines blew. So there was smoke coming out the other end of the oh So I thought, okay, back to Loyola. I'm going back to Loyola. And the sales guy said, no, 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 no. I mean, this was a big deal. It was a two-day seminar. So we ran across to the airport, and he bought nine tickets, and we went on a prop jet. So I'd never flown us. So I went from the Learjet to the prop jet. So <laughs> Out on the prop jet, everyone's getting on, getting on. I'm just really, really anxious. And then uh, the, the plane was full. And then all of a sudden, this gentleman kept clabbering in, coming back from the background of the back of the plane. And he had a, this, he was all disheveled. And he had a couple holes in his sweater. And it looked, I thought, what is he doing? Get in the plane. And they nudged me and they said, that's the pilot. Oh, I said, okay. <laughs> Then I really got terrified. But I tell you, I just love that flight because I could see all the landscape. And it was just, it was just really great. And uh, coming back, we did fly in the Learjet. And I just loved that experience. I got to sit right up front. And I got a great tutorial about all the bumps in the air and everything else and the instrument panels. And then I was convinced that's until the next flight. Then I got nervous all over again. But that's my little airplane experience. But uh, so... Yeah, good. <laughs> I can't escape. <laughs> um, so that's my story. Um, Betty, I'm going to ask you to come up now. Betty's the chair of our membership committee, and she's going to introduce our new members and, and guests. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, this morning we've got five guests, so I'd like to introduce them first and have you stand in place so we can welcome you officially. Laura Godfrey. Ah, there you are. Great. William Butterfield. Doug Johnson. Okay, Doug, way in the back. Nancy Little. Oh, there you are, Nancy. Great. And Thomas Chuff. Great. Uh, let's welcome them. And then you know that our new member list is sort of revolving. We try to pick up people who have joined in the summer. I'm looking at two of them who are finally able to be here and be introduced. So we'll start, and I hope I don't mispronounce your names. Carol Bauman, mentor Karen Van Dam Mitchmerheisen. Great. I don't believe Frank Cunningham is here. Uh, Robert Godfrey, mentor Robert Fry. Just stand. Oh, I'd like you, the new members, if you could just come on up here quickly <laughs> so we can see your faces. This is Carol over here. This is Robert. Terry Julius, mentor Lynn Berkey. Oh, okay, and, great. Terry is right there. Joe Koziel, Sue Koziel, mentor Shirley McClear. I don't believe Janice Kramer is here. Mary O'Connor, Steve O'Connor, mentor Sharon Blum. Robert Pott, mentor Eunice DeWitt. Greg Sewell, mentor Andre Canoe, and Jackie Sewell. Judy Smith, mentor Judy Zeilman. Nancy Turbeek, mentor Lauren Mengs. Herbert Tews, mentor Dennis and Mary DeWitt. And Stan Wittabeen. Mentor Kit Leggett. And I believe that our last one, Martha Zahn, is not here. Oh, Martha, you're here. Come on up. 
<laughs> Great, you snuck in. <laughs> Let's welcome all these new members. I just need to quick say that um, Janet Kramer is here, and she is a longtime member of HASP, but we have a new member named Jan Kramer, not, not at all confusing, uh, who is being received later. So I know Janet Kramer has been getting a lot of questions about that. There she is back there. You can wave. Um, but now we also have a Jan, so that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Betty, and welcome, members and guests. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's get on with our program about air travel and airports. And we'll have Andre Canal come up. He's a member of our program committee and is going to introduce our speaker. I feel like runway. <laughs> right. Good morning. I'd like you to take a minute and just think about the many reasons why Holland is such a wonderful place and how it's become one of Michigan's best managed cities. There are a number of reasons, a lot of reasons, and um, good bones, good infrastructure, good collaboration, negotiation, management, and people. And our speaker today is one of those people. When you review important projects undertaken by the Holland City government, one repeatedly finds Greg Robinson's fingerprints on a lot of projects. Whether it was downtown development, leading economic development initiatives, and of course, airport development. Greg came to Holland in 1984 as the city's first downtown manager and oversaw the Main Street program, working closely with business owners and investors in developing a vision for the downtown area. He oversaw the 1988 reconstruction of 8th Street, known as Streetscape, which included the installation of the city's snowmelt system and worked with developers in the restoration of downtown buildings. He was the guy who worked with all the merchants, all the design programs, and all the property owners. A real challenge, I think. He served as the city's first planning and development manager and as assistant city manager for 23 years during that tenure, he was the city's liaison to such entities as the Makotawa Area Transit System. He was responsible for the oversight of the airport and played a leading role in the establishment of the West Michigan Airport Authority in 2008. Additionally, he served as Holland's interim city manager until Ryan Cotton took that position. In 2014, upon Greg's retirement from the city, the West Michigan Airport Authority hired Greg as its manager. Please join me in welcoming Greg Robinson, who will speak on the airport, its value to the community. Well, good morning. I don't know if this is going to stay up, but that's all right. Maybe it'll work just right, right from this uh, standpoint. Well, I see many familiar faces, actually, this morning. I think I saw a Cubs shirt. <laughs> I think I saw an Indian shirt out there somewhere. Yeah. And I know there's a Brewers fan here. I don't have to quite sure what that's all about, but we're a very inclusive group. Yeah. And, and I'm Greg Robinson, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, I've, I've had the pleasure to actually work with a number of you and interact with a number of you on all sorts of projects. Uh, during my 30 plus years in this community. Actually, when I came here in 84, uh, I thought I'd be here for three years at the most. Uh, that's kind of what the, the arrangement was, and they, were, they weren't quite sure whether there'd be funding beyond that three year period. So that's kind of what I had my, my sight set on. And, uh, you know, so that was what, 32 years ago. You know, we're still here. And, uh, and, and as all, all of you know, um, some of the main reasons for that, it's a wonderful community, uh, the way people work together, the types of things that we work together on, I think have just been inspiring. And for our family, uh, to put our kids through the school system here was just a real plus for us. We had a lot of confidence in that, and that's worked out very well. And it's just been a great place to live and to raise our family and interact uh, with, with many friends. So. Um, I want to start today by talking about uh, why 
why I work with the airport, and this is the only time I'm going to talk about myself, but just as an introduction to the airport and its value to the community. Um, with the city, uh, for a time there, I was able to oversee their economic development efforts. And during that time, and it's not that long ago, 2008, 2009, uh, there was double-digit unemployment in residents in the city of Holland. It, it was incredible, the number of people that were unemployed. And um, when I was asked to do that for the city and work in tandem with a number of other groups, uh, one group that Lou Hallisey certainly uh, oversaw for many years, a Chamber of Commerce, working with them and Lakeshore Advantage and so forth, uh, I just saw firsthand, not that I wasn't aware of this, but firsthand, one-on-one, -on -one, direct contact with the value of providing employment opportunities in this community. Seems like a no-brainer, right? Uh, but it's a very foundation to our community, uh, to the quality of life for the families, for the individuals who call this home and want to continue calling this home, um, for the children that we raise, for our grandchildren, for them possibly to have the opportunity to live here, to, uh, for our businesses to want to stay here and grow. And to think about all of the elements that come into play in order to make this an attractive place. And, you know, we, we can make comment, and it's very important, comments like the downtown and uh, the great park system and certainly the lake and all the other positive things that we enjoy about Holland, but there has to be a certain business infrastructure in place to make it work, first and foremost. So whether that's roads, whether that's uh, support in the business community, uh, how do we connect our companies with suppliers, and so on and so forth. And it's really not all that long, it doesn't seem to me, uh, all that long in the overall perspective that our companies and that the economies in our community have become truly global. Um, the vast majority of our major employers in this community deal on a global basis. Either they have clients overseas, and I'm going to show you a map where planes fly from our airport to. Either they have clients overseas, or they have plants in China, plants in Mexico, plants in Europe. They need to get employees. Uh, they need to get expertise, potential clients back and forth. Uh, a comment made to me one time by Fred Bauer of Gentex uh, years ago was, you know, Holland's pretty important to us. It's in the forefront of what we, how we live every single day. But to somebody in Europe, to somebody in the South or the West, he said, Holland's really podunk to them. It's hard to get them to fly to Detroit or to Chicago to interact with you and to see what you do as a company, let alone to try to get them to where? To Holland, where? <laughs> So he talked about the value of being able to convince people for a few hours out of their day, I can get you from such and such a place in to take a look at our company. And the value that was to bringing contracts and employment uh, into the company. So what do I find inspiring about the airport? What that facility, what that asset does as a job provider in this community? I have seen it that our companies, our major employers, are able to consider this place for expansion, for continued growth. One of the reasons is the airport. There are a number of other reasons too, but without the airport, uh, I'm convinced they'd be looking at other places that did have the airport, whether it's Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, whether it's Muskegon, Chicago, there are a lot of other places they can go that are closer to suppliers, closer to customers than Holland. This here is an inspiration to me um, so that we are able to convince them and make this an attractive place for them to stay and to grow. So, uh, also, as we looked at the airport then and what do we need to do uh, to con continue to meet the air travel needs of this community, I can tell you now our airport serves about 95%, 97% of our traffic is corporate related. 
So commercial, I mean, we can't go as individuals and get on a plane and fly to a connection in Chicago, fly to a connection in Milwaukee or Detroit. And uh, in anticipation of a question I might get in a half hour, I'll just say that that's really not where the commercial air industry is headed anyway to uh, look to develop further in smaller communities. Uh, they're not looking to do that. So we are focused on the corporate air travel. We're always keeping our minds open to the potential for serving commercial links you know, between other major air hubs. But if we do that, and we might be able to do it some point in the future, it'd probably be by a more non-traditional means rather than uh, Southwest Airlines or United or whatever, it might be something different where we're using a local aircraft uh, to uh, now meet those links. There are a lot of challenges to that, but I think we're going to have to be creative if we really see a demand and a need to do that. But so we're focused, and I, I tell you what, it is so impressive at the airport on some mornings to see jets lined up to take off to do business in other parts of this country and other parts of this world. Uh, it is a truly impressive thing to do. So um, we consider this our Holland's uh, and this West Michigan's air gateway to the, to the world. Oftentimes, it's the first impression of visitors to our community who are thinking about doing business here. That's their first impression is when they fly into our airport and what they see right away. And as you know, the long uh, stated thing, you know, your best time to make that first impression. You know, so that's, that's always what we're concerned with as well. How do we make a good first impression? And first and foremost, how do we continue to stay ahead of the air travel needs of our, our community? Uh, this slide is a little difficult to see here, but uh, so since we don't offer commercial service, maybe some of you don't even know where the airport's at, and I would understand that. Uh, we're in the south side of the city of Holland, just before 196 as you head down South Washington Avenue. So if you've been to the McDonald's there at South Washington, uh, just keep going around the bend over 31, and we're just there by Crown Motors. So uh, as you head on South Washington, you'll come to a light there right by Yang Fang Industries, which used to be uh, JCI, used to be Prince before that. There's a little play that I'll probably come back to in all these changes. Um, and then you turn at the traffic light, turn left on Gearing's Boulevard, take it all the way to the end to our new terminal. So, and along that way, there are a number of private corporate hangar spaces that uh, uh, employees and visitors will turn into to catch their aircraft. Just to give you an idea uh, of those who use our airport uh, in our community, and let me just say our community, I consider it to be the West Michigan region, because that's truly what's, uh, what happens here now. This will just give you a feel, and as you'll see on these two slides in particular, Probably every major employer in the region relies on this airport to some degree. I saw a number just yesterday where the state of Michigan was asking us, they're doing an economic benefits analysis of airports, and they were asking us the number of employees um, that are related to our airport in some way through companies that use our airport. How many employees do they represent? And the number was over 75,000 employees are related to companies that fly out of our airport. You know, I even stepped back and I looked at that number, I said, are you sure with that number? And uh, the gentleman who worked on that said to me, yes, you gotta think about it. It's not just companies in the city of Holland and the city of Zeeland and Holland Township. Uh, it are, there are companies beyond that that fly out of here on a corporate basis. And their employees are relying on those contracts that come back from those visits uh, to other places. So the number was about 75,000 plus uh, employees. Here's a map, if you can see it, of where planes fly to from our airport. I don't know that you really need to see the detail of this map, because just think about anywhere on the globe and there's probably uh, a line stretching to it. So, um, you know, whether it's uh, the, the Far East, whether, of course, it's, whether it's the Midwest, the United States, or all over the United States, whether it's to Canada, Alaska, South America, Africa, Australia, points all over Europe, um, all over the Middle East. Uh, there are all sorts of locations. It's truly impressive to see uh, where they fly uh, to uh, from, from this airport. 
Just a few testimonials. This is from Lakeshore Advantage, just some information that they have. Again, stressing this point. The Holland Zealand market, think about this for a minute. Uh, the Holland Zealand market is the second biggest export economy in Michigan. Second biggest export economy in Michigan. Um, the Holland Zealand market. You know, when I think about that, of course, I think about Detroit, I think about Grand Rapids, you know, I think about uh, Central Michigan, uh, Southeast Michigan, even beyond Detroit, and still we're considered the second biggest export economy in Michigan. 62% of Lakeshore companies report an increase in international sales compared to 21% around the country and around the state. 62% in our region. 53% of Lakeshore companies compete on a global basis. And like I mentioned to you and showed you in those slides with some of the logos, uh, our major employers uh, are in that group. And those of you who have been in the business community for a long time know that uh, it's not only the corporations themselves, the Hayworths and the Herman Millers, Request Foods and Zealand Farm Services, it's, it's not only them. There are a lot of companies, there are a lot of employees that depend on them, that supply them, that also are in that chain of a, a dependence upon those worldwide interactions. Uh, Chamber of Commerce testimonial. Uh, they are, the Chamber represents 1,300 member businesses, global businesses depending on, the, on a high quality airport to conduct their business. And then, uh, so not only do we do corporate, uh, you know, focus largely on the corporate travel needs, but then we do uh, also recreational uh, uh, air travel at the airport, but also Wings of Mercy. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Wings of Mercy and what they do providing free air service uh, for those uh, having medical needs that can't afford to get to where they need to go otherwise. It's really truly a moving service the closer that you get to it. Um, and meet some of the people that rely on companies, rely on individuals and their aircraft who donate their services to get them to the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic or uh, points beyond for their medical needs, otherwise they couldn't get there. So um, over 850 free flights have been flown out of West Michigan Regional Airport. And this sec a segment here of the presentation, I'll just close with where, where do these employees live that work for these companies? As many of you know, of course, they, you know, they work all over uh, in West Michigan. Some of them travel great distances every day to work in our companies. But also, you know, certainly, whether it's Park Township, Holland Township, the city of Zealand, Zealand Township, Fillmore Township, Lake Town Township, and the city of Holland, uh, many of our residents obviously work at the very companies uh, that use the airport. And I think, you know, I'll touch here in just a minute on our member governmental units, so well, maybe I'll do that right now, and how we're governed uh, at the airport. So how do we keep that airport operating to make sure we can meet the air travel needs? One thing we want to make sure is we don't fall behind. The last thing we want is a company making a decision on where they're going to expand, where they're going to construct that new plant, uh, and they decide to make that decision to locate somewhere else or expand somewhere else because of the airport, and we didn't know that. So we're always trying to stay out there on top and make sure that we're ahead of uh, future needs if we possibly can be. So we have a governance structure that's made up of Park Township, City of Zealand, and the City of Holland. Uh, it's a West Michigan Airport Authority. It's been in place since 2007 uh, and 2008. First started in 2007, started collecting a uh, a relatively modest millage in 2008. If you think about Park Township, there's not an industry in Park Township, right? But they recognized that many of their residents, many of their homeowners, uh, worked at these companies that depended on the airport, on air travel, and they wanted to make sure they had a seat at the table to make sure that those air travel needs were being met. City of Zealand, uh, City of Holland, also uh, certainly wanted to make sure that they were at the table to talk about the future of this airport. Our annual operating budget, and I'll just say those governing units, uh, one of the real pleasures for me in working with the airport authority, each one of them appoint three representatives to the board. Uh, and they meet monthly and then they have subcommittees that meet 
uh, in between those monthly meetings. But to watch the interaction, <clears throat> excuse me, of those three governmental units <clears throat> is a very positive thing for our community. I mean, any time we can get beyond just working in our buildings, working on our own facilities, and we can interact with others in the community that are doing similar things that impact the quality of life in the community, the more of that we can do, of course, the better. And to watch these folks interact uh, on this one item um, is really a, that's a rewarding thing as well. Our annual operating budget, almost 400000 uh, in the year that we're in right now. <clears throat> Our capital, excuse me, capital budget to work on projects, this year is about 480000 That fluctuates. Last year it was $7 million. Um, this year it's 480000 uh, we had a budget back in the early 2000s. Our capital budget was $21 million for that year. We've had a capital budget in a year of 50000 So it really fluctuates depending upon the needs uh, at the airport. <clears throat> but I think an important thing to note on this slide, you'll see the local contribution to that 480000 is 15%. So for over, almost all of our projects, the Federal Aviation Administration and the state of Michigan they're huge players in funding these. So when you fly commercially, uh, you pay a tax on your ticket. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> that goes into uh, an airport trust fund at the federal level. And the aircraft uh, who fuel uh, the planes uh, for those travels, <clears throat> they pay a tax as well. That goes into that airport trust fund. Uh, and as long as that airport trust fund isn't set aside to make the budget balance look better at the federal level, those funds then are allocated to airports throughout the country. So they fund 80, 85%, 90%, depending on the project of our projects. Uh, so our relationship with the FAA is pretty important. Um, and then the state usually kicks in about 5% as well. So the leverage is pretty good for our local dollars uh, to do our capital projects. Uh, and just to give you a feel for the, uh, um, for the millage rate that we levy. So we do, so if you're in the city of Holland, if you're in Park Township, if you live in the city of Zealand, uh, you do pay a millage support the airport. Full disclosure, here's my tax bill. I live in the city of Holland, and um, you'll see I pay almost $900 to city services, which actually I, since I worked with the city for a number of years, I know what those go to, so I'm thankful for that. <laughs> uh, to the library, I pay about $80. To the school system, whether it's public schools, state of Michigan, to uh, education tax, the Ottawa Intermediate School District, you know, I pay uh, quite a bit of money there. I don't have any kids in the school system, but you know what? I did have four sons in the school system for a number of years, and I'm very thankful for that. And I certainly am thankful and, uh, to, and we're, uh, certainly willing to support uh, the public education system and, uh, in our community. Ottawa County, the Community Pool Authority, MAX, uh, and then there's the West Michigan Airport Authority. Six, I pay $6 out of my $2,600. Uh, so a tenth of a mill. It's the lowest tax rate of any governing unit here in, uh, in our region. Um, and that's what goes to help support what I consider to be an economic development asset uh, to our community. Uh, so let me talk about how we do what we do. Tulip City Air Service, we contract with them to provide the day-to-day -day operation. So I'm here making a presentation to you. They are there doing all the, really, they're doing all the work, all the things that need to be done to keep this airport going. And uh, I'll just give you a feel for that. <clears throat> they provide charter service. So actually, of all those companies that fly in and out of here, uh, Tulip City Air Service services some of those. They fly more operations out of our airport than anybody uh, with their charter service. So <clears throat> very valuable uh, to, to our community, Tulip City Air Service and that charter service that they provide. And just to let you know, this helps us track how the economy's going uh, when we talk with them. How much fuel are you selling? How much charter business are you doing? Uh, because that gives us a feel for what's going on in our, in our community from an economic perspective. Uh, it's not going well. We know then we get a feeling that something's on the horizon. Things are picking up. Some, you know, when, when we hear those comments, we usually hear those 
long before you read about them anywhere or you actually experience the numbers anywhere. So those are good first indicators for us. They maintain aircraft at the airport. They're a certified aircraft maintenance repair station. They provide fuel at the airport. Uh, well, you may not want to see this slide. It's a long ways off. It's a long ways off. But they, uh, they do the snow removal at the airport. And, and basically, a standard they use, if it's an inch, uh, they're out there plowing. You know, I mean, the last thing you want, of course, is a large jet, uh, you know, with, with or without a large number of people on board sliding off a runway. Uh, so we, they keep that plowed um, regularly during that, that time of the year. And then also, there's times where we have to de-ice aircraft. So on that slide in the lower right-hand corner, it's just a, a, a photo of uh, that taking place. Uh, they conduct flight school. So they do flight training there. Education, we interact with the uh, education uh, system in the community, uh, uh, informing them about what goes on at the airport. And uh, that's always a, that's a fun thing to do, especially uh, with the younger groups, but also with the older groups as they're thinking about what they want to do with their lives, their careers. Uh, we had, uh, the city of Holland has a program where it's called the uh, Youth Advisory Council. I think the city of Zeeland has one as well where youth in our community, high school youth, they are assigned to various boards and committees. And we have three youth, uh, I think one from West Ottawa, one from Holland High, and one from Holland Christian Schools that now serve with the uh, Airport Authority Board. Uh, one member that left us last year, she graduated and on to college, she's training to be a pilot uh, now. She's just inspired by being around aircraft. It's kind of opposite of uh, the pre your president. But um, so she's, she's being trained and uh, hopefully will go to uh, uh, come out with a degree uh, in that. So uh, aircraft, just give you a feel for some of the aircraft using the airport <clears throat> from the small aircraft in the lower right hand corner. And uh, if you look up in the upper left hand corner, actually that's not the largest aircraft that uses our airport. So uh, there's quite a range of aircraft that use it. Let's see. All right, so this, when I, took, when I mentioned the uh, gateway to the community, people thinking about doing business in our community. What's this community all about? It's so hard to get people to come to Holland, <clears throat> and then you get them here, and what's our first impression? This uh, was our office building until about two months ago. This was our terminal. Um, I mean, years ago, it served, we were fortunate to have it, to be honest with you. It served well for a while. Uh, actually, it's a former ranch house, and uh, our airport manager worked out of one of uh, what used to be a bedroom uh, in this particular building. The lower right or the lower left-hand side, that was the waiting area. And you're seeing the waiting area. That's not just a portion of the waiting area. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So... Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time, <clears throat> and actually uh, J Jody Science is here today, and Jody, uh, I followed her into this position years ago in the mid-1980s when the city bought the airport from Prince Corporation, and Jody was involved in that, and uh, she worked with the airport and this facility and a number of other things for, for years until I then uh, took that position after she left and went on to bigger things. So... We've been working with this building for a long time, and it has served a good purpose, but uh, for a number of years now, we've, we've recognized certainly it no longer functionally meets the needs of the airport in terms of waiting area um, and all the other facilities, pilot lounges, and all the other things that you do at an airport. And interestingly enough, um, pilots have a big say, well, this is gonna seem really obvious on the surface, but pilots have a big say on where aircraft actually go. We know they fly them there, but they could choose you know, which airport they go to. I mean, if it's relatively close, they may choose a certain airport based on the facilities that are provided at that airport. So um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we could meet the needs of pilots so that in the air community, our airport was talked of highly. Um, so that's what it was. This is what it is now. Okay, so uh, we moved in on September 7. 
uh, into this building. Uh, the other building was 2,000 square foot. Uh, this is 7,500 square feet. Uh, on the lower right-hand side, you see our new lobby. <clears throat> so uh, it can serve many more. It is really rewarding to see how that lobby is being used now, not only by those wishing just to watch aircraft, but also the way pilots use it, the way cust potential customers, the way employees waiting for aircraft or getting off aircraft, the, the way that they uh, use that lobby, just as we had hoped. Uh, some of these are perhaps too small for you to see, but these are a number of different rooms in the building. So in the upper left-hand corner, the lobby, the upper right-hand corner, a conference room. Uh, it's a main conference room, and we've already had uh, anecdotally two, uh, two experiences given to me of uh, people getting off the aircraft, seeing the new terminal, walking in, seeing that conference room, getting on the phone, and people meeting in the conference room. We had one flight of it, apparently, that came in late. And when they saw that conference room, they just gathered everybody at the conference room. So they could not have done that before. So we're finding another way to service uh, our community. Uh, the middle slide on the right, that's a smaller conference room, a more private concert conference room. Uh, the middle two slides, new pilot's lounge, <clears throat> and then the lower left-hand side, reception area. Just give you an indication about the uh, level of commitment to the, to the project. Um, the building itself was about two and a half million dollars uh, to do that. The overall project was just under seven million. Uh, actually, to put in the concrete for the aircraft to park on, uh, which I'll show you in just a minute, that's more expensive than the building. The aircraft is, you know, it's about that, I mean, the uh, uh, concrete's about that thick. You know, it's a little thicker around the edges, and it's just expensive. I can't tell you how many times I said to the engineers, how much again? <laughs> uh, how big, remember, we said it was going to be this large. Let's look at this again. But uh, I, I couldn't believe it was coming in more. Uh, than the building itself, but um, we had to acquire property, all sorts of things went into this, to, the, to this project. So here's just another view of the new terminal. Uh, you'll see some of the aircraft again parked on the new apron, the lower right hand. Uh, it was really our ribbon cutting ceremony that we had a couple of weeks ago, where we did a ribbon cutting on the actual a new apron, and then we did one inside the building. <clears throat> what I want to point out here just for you to get a feel. Some of you were there, I know. Uh, some of you made contributions to this project in different ways, and we, uh, we are so appreciative of that. But you just get a feel for uh, the support the community has provided to this project. Uh, all the furnishings, all of the furnishings in those conference rooms, in the lobbies, the reception area, all provided by Hayworth and Herman Miller. Uh, they worked in tandem uh, to do this with us. Um, you know, okay, we'll do that main conference room. Okay, we'll do the lobby. Okay, we'll do this part, we'll do that part. And we have portions where their furniture's right there and uh, uh, right next to each other. So we see it not only as a great contribution, but another way to showcase uh, what's going on in our community from a business perspective. Um, we've had, uh, I can't tell you offhand the number of individual contributors but we've had over $560,000 in private, local contributions to make this project happen. We, had, uh, we have glass on the windows uh, here in the, in the terminal on the inside uh, that's made locally, that was provided in part with a reduced price uh, just so they could be part of this project. And those stories go on and on. <clears throat> so uh, it's very rewarding and uh, we're very grateful for the level of support in this community. Uh, let's see, the future. <clears throat> and again, this is a view outside from the lobby out to just a portion of the apron. The future with corporate air travel uh, is much more um, flexible, much, it changes so quickly compared to commercial air travel. And if you think about commercial air travel, and you know how things change, and sometimes it seems like things change quickly with the way we travel around the country ourselves, uh, with the number of airlines that we have available to us, 
who's flying nonstop, who's flying, how many stops is it going to take me to get to wherever we're going. Uh, corporate air travel sometimes I think can change even faster. <clears throat> Those who are our biggest users today may not be our biggest users a year from now or maybe even six months from now. Those who aren't even using the airport now or are using charter now all of a sudden call and say we want to put up a hangar and we want to put it up within the next couple of months. Or you know some things like that. It just it can change quickly. And then we, you have some that are uh, very stable but you know for years they flew into Canada and now they're not flying into Canada. Now they're going somewhere else and needs change. So the main challenge for us as we think about the future is De trying to determine what the future will be. And we know the global business, that that's going to continue. We need to make sure that we are providing that global access from our community. And uh, so trying to stay ahead of that is a challenge. And that's what we're working on all the time as we think about the future. How can we be prepared to meet those needs that come up next week that we hadn't thought about the week before? Maybe we hadn't thought about for years. So um, that's what we're always doing in the planning stages, uh, trying to think about. And it's not uh, uncommon for all of you, too, uh, for what you do and what you have done throughout your lifetimes. You're always trying to think ahead. <clears throat> I already talked about commercial air service. Not likely, certainly in the near future. And uh, the challenge for us, I think, is uh, our revenue base, making sure that we have a stable revenue base so that we can continue to meet the needs. So that uh, we don't have companies asking us questions like they used to. Uh, and Jody can probably attest to this. And actually, uh, Ben Smith for a number of years is very close to the airport as well. He certainly could, and others in the room could, where <clears throat> needs come up and the question is, can you do that? Will you be able to do that? So the FAA sends, says, we'll fund 90% of your project. Holland, can you come up with the other five? And there have been years where we've said, uh, we'll work on that, you know, kind of a thing. We'll get, we'll get on it. We have never, I don't think we've ever said no. <laughs> we've always said, and we've always been able to do it, but it's been a, but it's been a real challenge. So having a f stable funding base is really critical to us. So working on that, um, so we're looking at other opportunities at the airport for future development. How can we use the land we have for greater purposes so we have other revenue streams beyond what we have now. So uh, we're looking at business development efforts at our airport. <clears throat> so working with Lakeshore Advantage, the Chamber of Commerce, local companies to build more business uh, at our airport. Um, so th that is, a, is a, a new initiative for us. We're going to be much more aggressive and deliberate about that. Again, staying on top of our planning efforts. And then something that might be very boring. It used to be kind of boring to me until uh, I, I attended a certain session at an airports conference once. And this is uh, blacktop pavement. Blacktop pavement. I saw that on the agenda, you know, blacktop pavement. There's got to be another one that's uh, going on at the same time, you know, that I can go to. <clears throat> but uh, no, so okay, so I go to this blacktop pavement session, you know, and I walk in. And uh, the first thing that the, uh, the engineer said was, um, something along the lines of many of you probably weren't thinking about coming to this particular session, but I want you to know if you don't have adequate pavement, concrete, the planes aren't going to be coming in. They got to know when they land that you've got grade A, you're at the top of the line, they're not going to have to worry about that at all. And obviously, if I didn't come on sooner, the light bulb comes on, I, well, without that, I mean, that's, that's number one. You got to have that so that they feel entirely confident about landing their aircraft, taking the aircraft off in the airport. They don't have to question Holland. They know Holland is going to be there for them uh, when they're thinking about that. So uh, those are the major things that we're facing uh, in the future. And uh, with that, I think I'd, I'd like to open up the questions if I think that's part of the agenda. It is. All right. Good. It is. We do have time for some questions this morning. So if you have questions, yes, yeah, right here. When you walk through uh, commercial terminals, you see a lot of advertising of local businesses and features and attractions. Do you plan to sell such advertising or uh, provide it in the, in the terminal? Yeah. We haven't thought about selling advertising. I can tell you what we have thought about, and we've, been, uh, we've installed TV screens around the lobby area. 
what we want to do, and we may do this by other means as well, is we want to showcase what's going on in our community, not only community events uh, that we are familiar with, you know, over time, uh, but we also want to showcase what's going on uh, in our business sector. So we want to showcase the furniture, and we want to showcase whatever it might be uh, that's going on in the, in the uh, farming community and the battery uh, development and whatever it is that makes our community special. So when people fly in, uh, they're not just seeing a terminal, they're getting a message about a community they're flying into. So we haven't thought about the actual advertising, thank you. Uh, we've been, we've really, <laughs> and if you're interested, I'll give you my card. <laughs> But we have thought about how other ways to showcase our community uh, for people coming in. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, how many runways we have, the length of them? Are, is it adequate for the newer jets? And what expansion potentials are there? OK, all right, good. Uh, the runway we have now, the main runway, we have one main runway. It's 6,002 feet. Um, we expand, uh, expanded that, lengthened it from 5,000 feet back in the early 2000s. Um, that runway length, we did that to serve the jets, so now they can fully fuel and carry a full load of passengers uh, in and out of the airport. They couldn't do that before. That, uh, just to try to give you a perspective, Air Force One could land on our runway. We don't, ha and we've had that question, by the way, um, but our taxiway turns, our radiuses couldn't handle Air Force One. But the length of the runway <clears throat> could handle Air Force One. And I, when they told me what the turning radiuses can't handle, I said, well, what do we have to do to make the turning radiuses handle it? And then they told me, so we said, okay, let's keep talking about that one <clears throat> and see what we can do over time. But uh, just to give you a feel for how the size of the aircraft that it can handle. And did that answer all your questions or? One runway. We've talked about another one, which is called a crosswind runway. It's on our long-range plan, primarily for the smaller aircraft. When the con con wind conditions are not most favorable to them, it'd be safer for them to land in a different direction. But uh, that one's longer term on our plan. It is on our plan. It's been on for a long time and still on it. Can you expand? Do you have room to expand? Yeah. Um, Expansion opportunities, we would probably have room to the west if we wanted to lengthen the runway more. We don't see a need to lengthen that runway right now. But uh, other expansion opportunities are somewhat limited. But we have a lot of land now that we're underutilizing that uh, we're going to look to see how we can uh, use it better than what we do. Yep. You, uh, Greg, you mentioned international transportation. So I assume that a plane can take off at Holland and fly nonstop, say, to Monterey, Mexico. What happens in the reverse? Because you don't have any customs or immigration services here. Can you describe, yeah. am I correct, on the southbound, they can just take off and land in Monterey? I can't tell you just how far uh, most of them go before they have to refuel. I can't give you that, but I can't tell you about the customs service. We don't have customs service at the airport, so that is an issue sometimes, and we try to gauge how much of an issue it is. So, if there's a Customs matter, they have to land in Grand Rapids, clear customs, come over here. We have talked in the past, especially when one of our uh, main users was flying to Canada often, we talked about getting customs service at our airport and um, in ways we could do that and how much it would cost and all that. But then when that particular um, operation <clears throat> was not as frequent, uh, there was not as great a need. It's going to be probably 150000 or so for us to do that. We have space in the new terminal to do that. So if we do decide to do it, uh, we can do it right away. So um, that's something we keep an eye on. Good question. Here. Do, do you have storage for freight? And do you do quite a little freight out of the airport now? Yeah, that's a great question. Most of our freight comes in in the evening. Uh, after uh, most of us are there, those who uh, do things like I do and some of the other office work, uh, we're not there most of the time when the freight freight flies in. <clears throat> Oftentimes you can tell if you live in the city of Holland or Lake Town or Fillmore Township, you can probably tell when the freight flies in. Those aircraft are a little louder usually uh, than, than the corporate jets, uh, the typical corporate jets. We get much more freight than what I thought. We've been tracking it for the last two years. And uh, we do get much more freight than what I thought. We get, can't really store it 
at the airport other than outdoors uh, until it's picked up and delivered. But most of the time, when freight comes in and out of our airport, it means it has to get someplace in a hurry, <clears throat> faster than what a semi could do or whatever. So that's usually in and out, and storage isn't an issue. I can't tell you where storage at our airport um, does come into play. We have an agreement uh, with the Palisades nuclear plant that in the event of a severe nuclear emergency, uh, they could store equipment here that they would need um, you know, to, to serve that emergency. We're close enough where we would be a storage site for them. So uh, we have worked out an arrangement with them in places where we'd store it you know, in the event that they needed to do that quickly and bring in equipment from Dallas or somewhere else. But otherwise, we don't have a place really to store it. Question. We lived near Park uh, Airport, okay. uh, et cetera, and it's been there many years. When I was at Hope College in administration, uh, the planes would come in and out of it because it didn't have the uh, airport that you have. Uh, is I, we don't see any planes uh, regularly in uh, the Park Township. Uh, the lights are on at night, but there's nothing. I don't think there's more than one or two planes. Uh, is that an ability that uh, is needed, or should it uh, encompass with your airport? Yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, even though Park Township is a member of the airport authority, the airport itself is not part of the airport authority's governance. So that's governed by Park Township. Uh, the runway is much smaller than ours, and it serves uh, the smaller aircraft. Um, so I don't think that they're eligible for the state and federal funding at this point either. So it's really a challenge always for them to maintain the airport. We have not talked with them about any kind of uh, consolidation or the future of their airport. Uh, I know they have talked over the years on and off about uh, what that airport and what that land should be, but we have not had any direct conversation with that and with them on that, and we don't have it in our uh, short-range plan anyway to uh, engage in that conversation, but yeah. <clears throat> Sir, you are one of the most em enthusiastic reporters that I've heard in a long time, oh. and I want to congratulate you for being in charge of many things at our airport. You know, thank you very much. Thank you. A couple of questions, Greg. First of all, thanks for being here. But with the funding, is government money applied to only capital, or is it in operations? To operations as well. Actually, that local millage funds about 50% of our operations. And then the other 50%, we lease land to corporate hangars. Uh, so if, you're, you know, if your company that wants to locate your aircraft, or if you have more than one, Gentex has more than uh, one aircraft, you want to be out there, they pay rent to us for the land. Uh, we have public hangars that we lease. <clears throat> we charge um, 10 cents on every gallon of fuel sold at the airport. And then aircraft who land at our airport that aren't based in this area, you know, uh, they also pay us a a modest fee to do that. So that's how we generate our revenues. Thank you. The other question has to do with drones. Are you running into any issues with that? Uh, fortunately, we have not yet. Uh, we've run into more issues with geese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, which is really a serious issue. Uh, it's, but uh, I think um, we've handled the geese uh, thing right now, but the drones, uh, and the FAA is continually coming out with directives to us. Uh, we have not really had any significant issues with drones right now. Um, but actually, and here today, by the way, I didn't introduce him, uh, is Aaron Thalenwood right here. <clears throat> Aaron, uh, all of our staff at the airport authority is part-time. I'm part-time. Uh, we have a part-time communications person. We've just hired Aaron. He actually works full-time for the city, and they're giving us, uh, we're paying for it actually, a portion of his time. And he's uh, now the uh, assistant manager <clears throat> at the airport. Aaron, we need to get into the drone thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, Thanks, Peg. Last question. Can I walk in and charter an airplane if I have my wallet with me, or is that just corporate? Uh, where's that question coming from here? <laughs> OK, right. 
What, what's that? Can I walk in and charter an airplane? Yeah, I, I tell you what, uh, rather than walk in, call Tulip City Air Service. Okay, and, but it's uh, not just corporate. It's not it? just corporate. Okay. Nope.